Hi, I'm Alex. And I'm Caitlin. And today we are brewing an experimental gluten-free beer. Obviously we enjoy beer, but many people cannot because it has gluten in it. We have some friends that are visiting us in a couple weeks who have some pretty severe gluten sensitivities. So we are experimenting with brewing a gluten-free beer. I'm sure a lot of people would say, oh, there's not really very much gluten in beer at all. The processes naturally remove a lot of the gluten that would be in the grains. Um, but for people who are, are closer to the celiac end of the spectrum, even the smallest amount, even uh, trace amounts of gluten that get from one grain onto another, could be really problematic. We were at our homebrew supply shop, FH Steinbart, earlier today, and they said, honestly, someone with celiac disease probably couldn't even walk into our our business because there's just enough grain dust in the air. Gluten, 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 gluten. And obviously people who truly do have huge gluten sensitivities are going to avoid beer altogether. They'll stick with ciders or wines or hard alcohols and mixed drinks, but there's a time and a place where you really just want beer. Luckily these days there are some gluten-free beers that are coming onto the market, but there are a couple different processes by which you can make a beer gluten-free, and there are a range of beers that are gluten-free and actually still good. So the first way that you can make a beer gluten-free is by brewing it normally, completely normally with uh, grains that do have gluten. And then during the fermentation process, you can uh, remove the gluten that separates from the beer. In that process, you are removing most of the gluten. Technically, there are still traces of gluten in it. And for many people, if you are not, if you do not have celiac disease, uh, but you are gluten sensitive, of course, that process of gluten-free beer is going to be just fine for you. You might not notice any sort of issues, but for true celiacs, that was going to be a problem. So the second way that you can make gluten-free beer is by only using ingredients that do not contain gluten in the first place. This is a little bit harder, of course, because the gluten in grain is kind of important for beer. It's going to affect the process by which things break down. It's going to affect how the sugars uh, interact with the yeast and other components of the beer and many alternative grains have different textures different flavor profiles so there's a lot of moving parts. Groundbreaker Brewing is a completely gluten-free brewery here in Portland and they do some really clever stuff with their beers. Uh, their fermentables are coming from sorghum as well as they're getting some character from lentils and then chestnuts which they roast to varying degrees. It's actually a dark ale and they get the color and some of the flavor from I guess the chestnuts and lentils. Using those alternative grains it's difficult to get the true taste of normal beer. I think I, it would be a good comparison to liken it to veggie burgers mm. where you're trying to get something that's still tastes good and sort of fulfills that uh, textural need, but it's never going to trick you into making you think it's meat in most cases. A truly good gluten-free beer is going to taste almost like regular beer, but it's still not going to be quite there. So our goal is to make something that tastes good, mm -hmm. that's gluten-free, and uh, show you guys kind of how it works. It's kind of a crapshoot. We don't really know what we're doing. So one of the most commonly used I guess grain substitutes in gluten-free beer is sorghum. And fortunately, uh, a company that we work with quite a bit, or not work with, uh, but Brees Malting. Brees makes uh, malt extracts and a lot of the malts that we use. They create this product called uh, white grain sorghum syrup. Uh, it is 3.3 pounds of sorghum extract. Sorghum is going to have some similarities to malt extract. It's also going to have some really striking differences. It itself is actually a grass, not a grain. Uh, and if you go on the Brees website and look at their product description for this syrup, uh, when they describe the flavor profile, the literal only word they use to describe it is neutral. <laughs> so what that means is it's really basic. It's not going to give us a whole lot of flavor. So in putting together this recipe, we thought, okay, what else can we add to it? And usually if we were making a regular beer, that added flavor would come from your specialty grains, some more of those roasty sort of malts. Maybe Obviously, something caramely. Yeah, all of that is going to have gluten too. So we had to think, what are some specialty ingredients we can use that are going to give some of those darker, roastier, perhaps, flavors, but don't have gluten. 
So our, our next ingredient that we settled on that we knew we wanted to add is uh, buckwheat honey. Buckwheat is a distinct honey. It is obviously very dark in color. You wouldn't see this and necessarily think, oh, that's honey. Um, but it's, it's quite distinct. and actually even has a slightly uh, malt-like character to it. It is not malt and it's gluten-free, mm -hmm. um, but uh, we decided to add that for a little bit of color and a little bit of flavor. So then at that point we thought what other sorts of specialty ingredients could we add for a little bit of complexity, a little bit of character, and again we have this challenge of we can't use any malt, we can't use any wheat, we can't use any rye. We went to our homebrew supply shop and said hey what do you have that's gluten-free and they said honestly nothing. Uh, so we actually went to uh, Zupan's specialty food market and looked at different foods that were certified gluten-free that we could uh, just do different things with and do sort of a cereal mash. So one of those ingredients is teff. Uh, teff is a grain that's native to Ethiopia. It's been used, if you've ever had injera bread, that is fermented uh, teff flour. And so this is a naturally gluten-free grain. We're gonna see how this works again. And it is traditionally also used in beer. Um, they traditionally used it kind of back in the day in Ethiopia and probably still today. So it's not a completely unknown grain substitute for beer. And then finally, we're using some flaked oats to really smooth it all out and also give a little bit of toasted character. Oat is gluten-free on its own. The problem with most commercial oat manufacturers is that it is made uh, with equipment that has been used for wheat or it is rolled along with wheat, which therefore makes it not gluten-free. So you can go to the grocery store, you can find oats that are certified gluten-free and manufacturers that know that that's important and so that's what we did we got some flaked oats from bob bob's red mill bob's red mill <laughs> and we are toasting them to give them a little bit of that toasty flavor and quality yeah half of them half of them half of them we're toasting about a pound of rolled oats here in the oven uh, at 300 degrees we're going to set a timer for every 15 minutes to take these out, kind of mix them around, and it's really until they get to be that golden color we want. Depending on your oven, that can be anywhere from half an hour to an hour and a half. All right, we're starting this cereal mash with a protein rest up to water's at about 130 degrees, and here goes the oats. Basically just making fancy oatmeal. And now the teff. That is such a small grain. I hope we can strain that out. If not, it'll be chunky beer. Chunky beer! All right, so we are doing our first step as a protein rest, 30 minutes. We're trying to hold this really between 120 and 130. Right now it's uh, rolling in at like 125, so that's good. We'll put the lid on here, hope it retains that heat, and then we'll move up to a sacrification step in about a half hour. Okay, let's talk about yeast for a minute. Normally we would use liquid yeast, but since we're doing a gluten-free beer, obviously we can't do that because liquid yeast is made in malt with gluten malt. <laughs> so we picked up a dry yeast, which we're not too used to working with. This is a classic English ale yeast. And uh, the directions actually say to rehydrate it with water before you pitch it. But uh, the guys at our homebrew shop said that actually when people have a problem with this yeast, uh, it comes in the rehydration process. So they recommended to just pitch it right in the beer and right in, in the wort that we make. And this is actually a really big pitch for such a small batch that we're making, so we think it's going to be okay. We've heated this up to the sacrification temperature for the mash, uh, and because none of the stuff that we're mashing here is malted, uh, again it's teff and rolled oats, there, uh, we, we don't have any proof that there's actually any amylase in here. That's the enzyme that usually breaks down starches into simpler sugars. Uh, so I actually had to add amylase powder that we were able to purchase at the homebrew supply shop. We've uh, been letting this go for a little while in like the mid 150s. And uh, it's pretty experimental. Never done anything like this before. I'm gonna taste it now to see if there's any sort of sweetness coming out of it. It's still pretty starchy, pretty, oatmeal, malt oatmeal like, but, um, but I, maybe I'm just imagining it. Maybe it's power of suggestion. I feel like it's getting a little sweeter and that's what we're looking for to turn those starches into sugars. This 
just how they make beer on commercial systems. I am going to try it. It's not bad. What does it taste like? Um, I don't know. Oatmeal with some crunchies. Oatmeal with some crunchies. All right, here's our Breeze Sweet White Grain Sorghum Syrup. The heat is off. We're gonna drop this into our boil kettle before we turn up the heat, and then we'll get a gravity measurement, see what the actual sugar content is of this. It's really surprisingly similar to light liquid malt extract. All right, so because we're using so many experimental processes and ingredients, we don't really know what the uh, pre-boiled gravity is going to be. This is our first chance to really figure out exactly what we're working with and then make on-the-spot recipe adjustments. Using one of my favorite brewing toys, the refractometer. Oh, that is pale and hazy. Just gonna see what the sugar content is of this wort that we're working with. Ooh, it is low. <laughs> All right, so it's at 1035. After the initial measurement of gravity, we realized that we really didn't get much of anything out of the teff and the, um, the oats, which was a concern given how experimental this all is. Uh, and really there are two concerns there, one of them being that there's probably a lot of unconverted starch in this wort. And we have to be really careful with that in terms of uh, any sort of contaminants, bacteria might just go to town on that, whereas the brewer's yeast might not. Um, and so we have to be just really deliberate with our um, with our sanitation. But we also need to adjust the hop schedule, because that hop schedule that I had put in here before was based on the idea that this wort would be of a certain gravity and we would be balancing sweetness with bitterness. Uh, so I just we're going to still use the same amount of East Kent Goldings in this beer, but I've just adjusted when they're going in to make sure that it's not overwhelmingly bitter. Uh, and we'll keep rolling. Okay, let's talk hops. So we're using East Kent Goldings. We're using an English style yeast. Might as well use an English style hop. And we're putting half an ounce in right now at the top of the boil, and then we'll put another ounce and a half at five minutes left. Flame out. So we're adding in some buckwheat honey as our last little trick to get this to taste how we want it to. Buckwheat honey has a very distinct flavor. Ooh, it's thick. Uh, it's a pretty strong flavor as far as honey goes, but it tastes a lot like malt. It's kind of molasses-y, so we hope that that brings in some more of this normal beer flavor and helps kind of balance out all the interesting flavors we might be getting from our alternative grain. We're putting it in at flame out so that we don't miss out on some of those delicate flavors and aromas. Uh, and this will also hopefully help us get our gravity to a place where we want it. So here is the final product. We're just gonna give it a try. I think this is a perfectly drinkable beverage. It's I don't, beer like. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't trick me into thinking that it's beer, but I would enjoy drinking this. And if I were a, a gluten free beer drinker, I don't know. I might look elsewhere, but it was a yeah. fun experiment. It yeah. really really challenged us. It forced us to think outside the boxes. Thank you so much for watching and following along during this little experiment of ours. If you have other ideas of experimental brews or regular brews that you would like us to try, leave a comment below. Uh, let us know if you've ever tried to brew a gluten-free beer and what ingredients you used. How you did it better than we did. Yeah, we'll see you next time. Cheers.